It's uh, marvelous to see a packed house tonight. My name is uh, Roger Casey, and it's my privilege to serve as the ninth president here at McDaniel, and especially tonight to welcome you to the inaugural Ira G. Zepp Jr. Memorial Lecture. And uh, I am so delighted to see so many of you who uh, were friends uh, of Ira's and Mary's and many of our students, our new students, who have yet to learn about uh, this wonderful man and all that he did for this college. But uh, before we begin tonight, I would like to recognize the uh, members of the Zepp family that are with us. And if you wouldn't mind, if you could just stand for us a moment so that we could say a word of thanks uh, to you all. Would you join me? Thank you so much for uh, helping to make this event possible, and I also want to say thank you so much to so many generous donors who have contributed to this project uh, to uh, have an opportunity to bring the kind of speakers here to campus that uh, I'm sure that Ira would have uh, enjoyed hearing from and learning from. And to tell you about tonight's speaker, it's my privilege uh, to both thank and introduce uh, the chair of our sociology department. Our sociology department has been coordinating this year's lecture. And to do our introduction tonight, uh, I would like to bring up to the podium uh, Professor Deb Lim. Thank you so much. Deb. Well, I will echo the president's sentiments. Welcome. We are excited and ecstatic that we are standing room only. So, uh, and for those students standing in the back, I do notice if you slip out, so don't do that. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we're we're very excited. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, process of selecting a speaker and we're very proud and pleased that Father Roy Bourgeois uh, agreed to join us tonight and be our inaugural speaker. In doing my research for this um, introduction, uh, Father Roy Bourgeois, according to Wikipedia, is an American activist. And for those of you who know me, you might be surprised that I would cite Wikipedia given how I typically feel about Wikipedia, but um, I think in this case they're quite accurate. Uh, Father Roy is a native of Lutcher, Louisiana and graduated from the University of Southwestern Louisiana with a bachelor's degree in science. Uh, in geology. After college, Father Roy served as a naval officer for four years, uh, two years at sea, one year at a NATO station in Europe, and one year of shore duty in Vietnam for which he was awarded the Purple Heart. After military service, Father Roy entered the seminary of the Mary Knoll Mission Order. That's the, I, I'm not Catholic, so forgive me, but my understanding is that's the Catholic Foreign Service Mission Society, am I correct? Um, he was ordained as a Catholic priest in 1972 and went to work with the poor of Bolivia until he was arrested and forced to leave the country for working to overthrow the repressive rule of dictator Hugo Banzer. Am I saying that correctly? Banzer? In 1980, Father Roy became involved in issues surrounding U.S. policy in El Salvador after four U.S. churchwomen, sisters Clark, Donovan, Ford, and Cazes, were raped and killed by soldiers of the Salvadorian National Guard. Father Roy became an outspoken spoken critic of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. Since then, he has spent over four years in U.S. federal prisons for nonviolent protests against the training of Latin American soldiers at Fort Benning, Georgia. In 1990, Father Roy founded the School of the Americas Watch, an office that does research on the U.S. Army School of the Americas, uh, acronym SOA, now renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, or WINSEC, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Each year, the school trains hundreds of soldiers from Latin America in combat skills, all paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Father Roy has worked on and helped produce several documentary films, including the 1993 Gods of Metal about the nuclear arms race and the 1995 School of the Assassins. Both films received Academy Award nominations. Most recently, Father Roy was excommunicated for his participation in the women's ordination ceremony of August 2008. Father Roy was a recipient of the 1997 Pax Christa USA Teacher of Peace Award. This is an award given out annually to an individual who has exemplified Pope John uh, Paul's World Day of Peace message, to, re to, te to reach peace, you must teach peace. And in 2005, the Thomas Merton <coughs> Award, awarded since 1972 by the Thomas Merton Center for Peace and Justice Studies in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's given annually to national and international individuals struggling for justice. Father Roy travels extensively, giving talks at universities, churches, and other groups throughout the country, and we are just pleased and privileged to have him here with us tonight. Father Roy. Thank you very much. I just want to say it's a, it's a great blessing for me, a real honor to be here with you. As we come together to speak about peace and justice issues, we remember in a special way one of your own. That great professor, 
that I've heard so many stories about today. Uh, that wonderful peacemaker, Ira Zepp, who touched the lives of so many. And we remember him, of course, and we feel his wife Mary's presence with us in a special way as we gather. And it's a special joy, of course, to be with uh, the family of Ira and Mary. Peace and justice, that struggle, and that struggle for equality was such an integral part of Dr. Zepp's life. And really, in a way, it was part of his DNA. He talked about being peacemakers, struggling for justice. I don't know what can be more important, as he said. I must say it took me a while to get on that road to peace and justice. Coming out of a small town in Louisiana, we did not critique our country's foreign policy. We did not question our church's teachings. Um, we did not look at that issue of segregation in the schools there with critical eyes. It was the tradition. I went to the State University, worked hard at a degree in geology, hoping to get rich in the oil fields of Venezuela. <laughs> when I got out of college, it was during the Vietnam years. Being a patriotic young man, I, I felt it was important to, to serve my country. I entered the military and actually thought of making the military a career. As a young officer, I was out at sea. Was, in a way, it was my ticket out of Louisiana. And then in my fourth year, I believed our leaders when they said that our cause was noble. We were going to be the liberators in Vietnam. The same language we heard to justify the invasion of Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. That great prophet Isaiah, I think, says it very well. They will take evil and call it good. They will take a lie and give it to you as truth. And I and so many, of course, bought into that great lie which we saw as the war in Vietnam. <clears throat> and I went off to that war, believing again our cause was noble. But something happened, the violence, the suffering, losing friends there. But most of all, the suffering that we saw among the civilian population who are always the, who suffer the most their children, parents, grandparents. I came to the conclusion, not overnight, but after a lot of reflection, which began in Vietnam in the madness of it all, that we, as human beings, we are not made for war. Our creator simply did not make us this way. We have a conscience, a heart, and we simply cannot go about the business of killing and come home and go on with our lives as before. We're reading so much about our soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, the PTSD, the suicides. When will we learn we're not made for war? It was in Vietnam where death was very close and my faith became more important to me. God became very close. And I started thinking just as a Sunday Catholic that perhaps I was being called to serve my church as a Catholic priest. I talked to this army chaplain about that call and he recommended the Merino order. And I said, Mary who? I had never heard of this group. Um, a religious community working in 25 countries serving the poor overseas. I came home, my year was up. I was so happy to be back in Louisiana with my family and friends. It was like a new beginning. I was just so grateful to be alive. In the next six years in comfortable seminaries out east, I finally was ordained a Catholic priest and now assigned to our mission work in Bolivia. The first stop, Cochabamba, to go to language school. One of the worst students, I must say, to go through that school. <laughs> After six months, when I left the school and went into La Paz to begin my mission work, when I spoke Spanish, they thought I was speaking this indigenous language. <laughs> <laughs> But really, what I found was a new family. I was just humbled by the, the love, the hospitality, the patience, <coughs> taking in this gringo who could, they could hardly understand. But really, this became my home, this slum on the outskirts of La Paz, Bolivia, my home for the next five years. And I remember hearing here so many stories of Dr. Zepp, he, how he said the students were his teachers. And what I found, <coughs> found there were that the poor became my teachers. 
uh, they really introduced to me uh, their struggle. Uh, struggle for, for life, for peace, for justice. So many of the people of Bolivia as throughout the developing world today, our sisters and brothers, they live on the edge, they struggle for survival. And those shacks without running water, few schools for their kids, um, few clinics to be healed when they're sick. And so many simply will not make it beyond the age of four or five. And it saddened me to see in Bolivia, my country, the United States, supporting a brutal dictator general, Hugo Banzer, one of the many that we were supporting in that region during this time, the 70s. And there were the generals, of course, in, El in Central America, especially El Salvador, that we supported. It was in Bolivia that I was introduced to a new theology, a theology of liberation. That's very exciting, that gives hope to people. And I, we ask that question, if our theology is not liberating, para que sirve, for what does it serve? That theology really is born out of the struggle of the people. Uh, they name it, the poor, the oppressed. It's theirs. Where they gather in their comunidad as they basi, the small communities, to read and reflect on the scriptures. Where they come to discover a very loving God, a creator who has given every country more than enough resources for everyone to live comfortably. But what's been put there for all to share and to be responsible stewards of has ended up into the hand, in the hands of a small economic elite. Militarism has set in. Countries come in and support that economic elite to exploit the cheap labor and those vast resources. And they live off of the backs, the sweat of the poor. And I can only say if we, you and I, lived under those conditions that our sisters and brothers are living under in Bolivia and all of these other countries throughout the Middle East and the rest of the world, we would do what they are doing. They come together, as in Bolivia, and they say, basta, enough. They start organizing in their colleges, <clears throat> in the tin mines, in the workplaces, in the campo, in the countryside. And what this struggle is all about, it's about justice. It's about a redistribution of God's many gifts to these countries. It's about land reform, it's about a living wage. It's about schools for children and medicines to be healed with. It's about living in peace. What a wonderful, wonderful way to live where there's peace. It's a terrible thing, this issue of fear. To, I was so fearful in, in Vietnam and also in Bolivia. To, the, the fear that, that we lived under, under that brutal dictator and the men with the guns, it's terrible. The repression intensified. The jails filled up with college students and laborers and campesinos, the landless farmers, who were speaking out for food for the table. And I was in my fifth year among one of the many arrested. And I was forced out of the country, one of the fortunate ones. Many were killed, imprisoned. I came home, it was a very lonely time. I didn't really know where to go, what to do after a good visit with my family in Louisiana. I tried to get back to Bolivia. I was so missing my family there. But I was persona non grata, I could not return. They wouldn't give me that visa. My attention turned now, as many did, to El Salvador, a country far worse than the one I came from. It was in 1980 that Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated, gunned down in this church for his defense of the poor. It was that same year, just months later, four women from our country who went to El Salvador at the invitation of Bishop Romero to work with the poor. Uh, three Catholic nuns and a lay worker, two of them good friends, Maura Clark and Edith Ford of the Marino community. They were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military. And that really shook us. It, it really brought us to El Salvador with that basic question, how could this be? How could this happen? Once again, we found our country, the United States, deeply involved, giving guns and training to those at war with the people during the killing. I came back from El Salvador, and really we couldn't keep quiet. We had to speak out. Um, and when 525 Salvadoran soldiers arrived at Fort Benning, Georgia to start training, really in the art of killing, 
I and others canceled our speaking tours in the country and we headed to Fort Benning, Georgia. We had a small group, six of us. We rented this little house, we called it Casa Romero. And we started to organize. We gave talks in different colleges, universities like Auburn, different churches who would welcome us. And then we decided it was time now to stop talking. As Dr. Zepp and others felt it was time to stop talking about integration and start putting their feet in restaurants and addressing that issue with their feet. And um, so what we did, three of us from our little community, we went down to Ranger Joe's, an army surplus place. We got some army uniforms. <coughs> we dressed as high-ranking army officers. <laughs> and it was at night, we penetrated this high security area, we got saluted. It was a very shaky salute, I must say. But we had with us this very powerful boom box, this tape player that had the last sermon of Bishop Romero that he gave in the cathedral the day before he was assassinated, <coughs> where he made a special plea to the men in the military, saying to them, stop the killing. Lay down your weapons. Disobey your superior officers telling you to kill your fellow campesinos. And obey a higher law that law that says thou shall not kill. We can speak for hours about this great prophet, this martyr Oscar Romero, this great peacemaker. We were of course very afraid that night, but we felt really his presence, Bishop Romero's presence. And so we went near the barracks where the Salvadorans were housed and with three climbers, Linda Ventimiglia, Larry Rosebaum and I, we scaled this tall pine tree and we waited. And about 10 o'clock at night when the last lights went out in the barracks, we just said, Bishop Romero, this is for you, brother. And his voice boomed into the barracks. We saw this as a very sacred moment. They didn't quite see it this way. <laughs> <laughs> we had really poked the beehive here. Mm -hmm. They came out of the barracks with their guns, those German shepherds spotted us in the tree and ordered us down or they would shoot us down. It was time to come down. <laughs> but we did have Bishop Romero's last sermon that he gave to the military repeated a number of times. So we came down, but his message continued to, to be blasted into the barracks. We were brought to the county jail and then to trial. Our family members, loved ones, friends filled the courtroom. It was very difficult. When it comes to the civil disobedience, it's a hard thing to understand, especially for those, I mean, who don't feel called to act in this way. But uh, we wanted that day to put our U.S. foreign policy on trial, but the judge would have no part of it. We were charged with impersonating army officers in criminal trespass and sent to prison for a year and a half. And I must say prison was very hard and lonely, but it's one of the best retreats I've ever been on. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but those many years in the seminary, the Catholic seminary, was good preparation for prison. <laughs> <laughs> what we also discovered, of course, by the great peacemakers, uh, Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, Dr. Zepp, all, the, all these great peacemakers, they, they teach us that the truth cannot be silenced. And we spoke from our prison. We wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters, educating, um, talking about what was going on in that little country, El Salvador. We got out of prison in good shape. Our hope was intact. That joy was still there. And we joined the resistance, the thousands of peacemakers, many of you in this, you know, in Baltimore, in this area, throughout the country, trying to stop the military aid to El Salvador. That got up to a million dollars a day, all coming from our tax money, all being done in our name. But you know, we couldn't stop it. Our voices were not strong enough. November the 16th, 1989, they now went after the the Jesuits, a very big Catholic order of priests called the Jesuits. They run 28 universities here in the U.S. like Georgetown and other places. And they, like Bishop Romero and the church women, got death threats. If you don't keep quiet, we will kill you. 
And uh, Dorothy Kays, one of the, um, actually Jean Donovan, the lay missionary in the group, she said, we cannot leave. Where, where are we to go? What are we to do? We cannot leave our people. They are voiceless. They are suffering so much because their families were trying to get them to come home. It was too dangerous. But they're like the Jesuits and many said, we, we must stay with our people as the Jesuits did. And November the 16th of 89, the military after midnight moved into their campus, their college campus there, and dragged these six Jesuits, most of them scholars, out of their rooms. With them, a young mother, Elba, their co-worker, and her teenage daughter, Selena. And they were shot at close range. They were massacred. This made the front pages of our newspapers all over the country. It angered many of our members in Congress who knew some of the Jesuits, who had been educated at some of their universities. They sent a congressional task force to El Salvador to investigate. And they returned the congressional task force, headed by Representative Joe Moakley from Boston. They report that those responsible for this massacre were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. When we read this in our newspapers, we got on the phone and started talking. We've got to go back to Georgia. We have to go back to Fort Benning <coughs> and really investigate the School of the Americas that we knew very little about. So I left my work at the time. I was based in beautiful Minnesota. I know uh, there are no residents there doing peace and justice work. And we started, you know, our little group of 10 gathering there at the main gate of Fort Benning. Our very first action after a three-day retreat was a fast, a fast. Um, other great peacemakers have used the fast to expose injustices. Mahatma Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day, and others. Um, some in the civil rights movement. Um, fasting is, is, is a hard thing to, so perhaps to understand. But we said, we are going to, in the tradition of many great peacemakers, we are going to fast. It will be a water-only fast. Um, we made that decision at a nice restaurant. <laughs> uh, one thing I've learned in, in peace work, you know, never, never plan a fast at a restaurant, especially a good one. But really, it was a good idea because we started our fast, the 10 of us, um, and our little group was um, Charlie Litke. Vietnam vet, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, three Salvadorans, uh, Kathy Kelly, a Catholic high school teacher from Chicago, uh, a Jesuit, and a couple of others. And we just began a fast, water only. We didn't eat for the next 35 days. The most difficult thing I've ever been on. Our bodies grew weak, but the spirit remained strong. When you do this together, you sustain one another. You keep your hope, you know, strong. You remind each other why we're here, which we have to do often in the struggle. And I must say it was the first calling of attention to something that we saw that was very wrong. That was an injustice. A school that has caused so much suffering to others. We ended our fast, food never tasted so good. And then we had to get to work. We had to start doing research. And through the Freedom of Information Act, and helped along by members of Congress like Joe Kennedy from Boston and others, we pieced together the history of the U.S. Army School of the Americas. It had been around for quite a while. Started way back in 1946. All paid for every year by the U.S. taxpayers. It operated for years in Panama. And then in 1983, because of protest in Panama, it was referred to by students and labor leaders there as a school of assassins, as it became known throughout the region. And it was forced to leave Panama and settled at Fort Benning, Georgia, where today it continues to operate, training every year about 1,500 soldiers from 15 countries. They come here to learn combat skills, commando tactics, psychological warfare, counterinsurgency. Who are these insurgents, we had to ask. They are, in Latin America, who they've always been. They are the poor. They are university and college students who side with the poor. They're healthcare workers, religious leaders like Romero, the Jesuits, the church women. 
And most of all, they are the landless farmers who speak out for bread for the table and a living wage and land reform. They are seen as el enemigo, the enemy. They become the targets of those trained here. And then there was the United Nations Truth Commission report that got a lot of press shortly after we started to do our research that documented those who killed Bishop Romero trained here, those who raped and killed the church women, graduates. Among the 28 who killed the six Jesuits and the, their two women co-workers, uh, 18 of them graduates of the school. And then when it was discovered that in the curriculum at the school there were these torture manuals um, that were used as a part of the curriculum. This made the front pages of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other major newspapers around the country. And that's when our movement somehow began to blossom. The silence was broken. That wall that this school had been hiding behind for many years started to crumble. And we put the word out, our small group. We said, let us gather here at the main gate of Fort Benning every November that weekend before Thanksgiving, around the date of the massacre of the Jesuits and the two women. And let us keep alive the memories of the thousands who were killed by graduates of this school. Let, let us put our feet here to express our love and solidarity, a big word here. Solidaridad, solidarity with others. And I must say we started with, way back with just 10 of us. And then word spread and you know, 200 came the next year, and then 800, and 2,000, and then our numbers grew to 15,000. We're now preparing for our big annual gathering in November. It's the weekend before no Thanksgiving. It's that November the 18th weekend, and November the 19th. And I must say, it's a big celebration of hope when you look at the mass of people who come in from all over the country. We notice now more than half who gather among the thousands are college students who started to come into our movement about eight years ago. And we notice right now quite a few high school teach, uh, students with their teachers come. The religious women, the nuns, joined our movement in the very beginning, many of them working in Latin America, being very motivated by the church women. We have a lot of parents who come with their children, and what a wonderful way, of course, for us to teach our children about peacemaking. A lot of vets are there, Vietnam vets, veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq put their feet there with us. And they're always our senior citizens. Every year the grandmothers for peace come from California with their big <coughs> banner. We're at the main gate there, and then during the, the evenings, that Friday evening, Saturday evening, we take over the convention center downtown Columbus. We have all these workshops on peace and justice, all these issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, militarism, where we make connections. So many, then Sunday, Sunday, it's referred to as a very sacred time. It's become a tradition as we gather. It's, we started this in the early days. We, we, many people bring the, the small white crosses bearing the names of the victims in their ages, many, many of them children. Some come, of course, with the Star of David or the photographs of the victims. And the names are called out individually that Sunday as we process very solemnly to the main gate that chain link fence topped with barbed wire signs that say no trespassing. And something happens there that, that's very spiritual. Many weep because I think we touch on the sacred here when we call out the names of so many killed. And in unison, the thousands there will say, Presente, this person is present with us. And then when we get to the main gate that's chained, that's locked, we take those religious symbols, the crosses and the photos, and we put them in that fence. We turn it into this memorial wall with something very sacred. Many simply kneel in silence and pray. And uh, 
It takes about three hours for thousands of people to process and do that. It always has become also part of our tradition for some to go over that fence, cut a hole through it, or go under it. Once again, it's called nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, or some would refer to it as divine obedience. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that a little over 300 of our people over the years have done just that. They've gone on to Fort Benning. And when we do, we're, of course, charged with criminal trespass. The usual sentence, six months. Six months. And um, every year we've had folks, the, the largest group, well, I think, was like 32. And our, our numbers are getting a little smaller now because really, I mean, to, to simply take six months to go off to prison, uh, it's not easy. Most people study or have jobs, but really, I mean, there have been um, many who discern and make that decision. I must say, when they send our people to prison, something happens, it energizes our movement. When, when this judge retired just a few years ago, that well known as Maximum Bob, he always gave us the maximum, but when he retired after many years as the chief judge there and sent so many of our people to prison, I, I did send him a nice letter wishing him well, but I also thanked him for helping our movement grow. <laughs> because when he would send us to prison, he would bring more people down to the protest, to the vigil as we call it. Let me just say we're not going away, our hope is strong. We keep it our hands on the plow as Dr. Zepp and all those great peacemakers before us did. We're not going away. Where are we to go? Our movement will continue, and I'm happy to report over the last few years, delegations from our movement have gone off to 15 countries in Latin America. We've met with six presidents, some defense ministers, university and college leaders, indigenous leaders, and I'm happy to report after all this travel and 15 trips and many meetings, I'm happy to report that four countries have made a decision to pull their troops out. Those countries being Argentina, Uruguay, Venezuela, and Bolivia. And I must say, going back to Bolivia after all those years, it was wonderful to see friends there. I'm happy to say that there's a lot of hope in most of the region of Latin America and most countries. Um, there's a sea change taking place. A lot of countries are sidelining their militaries. They're electing presidents like in Bolivia, President Evo Morales, who we met with at six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the people of Bolivia are of the indigenous, the Aymara and the Quechua. And he is the first ever indigenous president. And he is so closely allied to his people, the poor, who make up the majority of the country, as in each country, the majority are the poor. And um, so there's great hope. And I just want to say in that meeting, he did say to us as, you know, as uh, U.S. citizens, our country is welcome. Come, he said, pero no como antes, not as before. Not as the conquistadors when they came to exploit the resources and the people. If you can come to our country as a partner in our development, bienvenidos, you're welcome. And we want to believe really as U.S. citizens, each of us here this evening, I mean, we want to believe that our country, the United States, is capable of going into other countries as a partner. But I must say we have a very poor track record in so many countries. We have not gone as a partner. We have gone in really with that top-down relationship, very, very vertical. We have gone there to exploit, to exploit, where there are huge profits to be made. But does it always have to be about profits? And we, of course, as people of faith, people of goodwill, we know, no, no. And the way to make friends is not to give guns to the soldiers oppressing the poor. You know, if we used all or half of that money that we've put into war, the billions for guns and weapons, and just use a fraction of that to build schools, clinics, to buy books, to improve the housing of so many of our people there. Wow. We would be so loved, so loved. And so I think there's a lesson there. War is not the answer, we know that. 
And so we move ahead, though, with great hope because actually next week we're going to Haiti. Many of you perhaps, some of you have been there. A country that's been really struggling for survival since the earthquake. Um, we've gone there to bring some funds that we've been collecting in solidarity. We want to go there to, to really, again, to learn, to, to speak with our brothers and sisters there and to take their stories, to take their stories back here. Um, there's a lot of struggle, a lot of suffering going on in this little country, Haiti. Um, Colombia, let me just say, we're very concerned. It's a high priority in our movement, Colombia in Honduras, where we just uh, went just a few months ago. A coup that took place in Honduras two years ago. Um, and Colombia, where most of the soldiers are coming from, about half of the soldiers being trained at Fort Benning School of the Americas, now, now called WINSEC, are arriving from Colombia. There are more labor leaders being killed in Colombia than any other country in the world. It's the most dangerous country for labor leaders, for union people. And that's a, a high priority for us. So we continue in the struggle. Let me just say it was in this movement of the SOA watch over the last really 20 years that I and others have been involved in so many in my travels to so many colleges, churches, peace groups. I discovered an injustice much closer to home, not out there in Latin America or the School of the America. I, I discovered this injustice in my church as a Catholic priest. I began to meet many devout Catholic women in our church who shared with me their call to the priesthood and their deep faith. And the Catholic Church, as you may know, has a teaching that only baptized men can be priests. And so I had to go back, of course, and do a little research. In the seminary days, we never really discussed this issue. We never questioned that teaching. It was always the tradition. And so we had to simply start asking a few basic questions that we profess as Catholics, the first being, we do say, as most people of faith from all tra many traditions, that our loving God did create men and women of equal worth and dignity, that we are equal, of equal standing. As Catholic priests, beginning with the Pope, moving down to bishops and most priests, we, we, all, we all say the same words. The call to be a priest is a gift and comes from God none other than God. So the question I began to ask my fellow priest and a few bishops and the Vatican, <laughs> who are we as men to say that our call from God is authentic, but your call as women is not? And what I discovered in asking that question was something very serious. Of course, they wouldn't give an answer, silence. They do know that the church's teaching simply cannot stand up to scrutiny. And what we have here, we, are just, we have discovered, so many of us, the majority of Catholics and a growing number of priests and bishops, we've got a grave injustice here, a grave injustice against women, against our church, and against our loving God who calls both men and women as equals to serve in the priesthood. And as we all know, when we see an injustice and we are silent about that, silence is the voice of complicity. Dr. Zepp put it this way. I, I thought I had the quote here, but it, it was, we were talking about that at, at, at lunch too. To know. To know and, and, and please. Know and not to, act. to know and not act is not to know. It's that same, you know, it's, this, it's that truth. Uh, if we know something, we have, you know, the burden of knowing. We must act. Our conscience compels us. And so I must say, as a priest for 39 years, knowing the consequences that I would be in big trouble, <laughs> I had to break my silence. And after I attended Three years ago, the ordination of one of the women, very faithful, highly educated, one of the many women called to be ordained, I attended, and it was a joyful occasion. The Vatican didn't quite see it that way. 
and just three months after I attended the, the ordination in Lexington, Kentucky, I received a very serious letter from the Vatican saying that I must recant my belief in public statements that support the ordination of women or I will be excommunicated automatically. I must say it was a serious letter. I went home to Louisiana to talk with my very traditional Catholic family, very close-knit, my siblings, my elderly father. And I was very happy to get their blessing. They and I and most would see the issue as conscience, and that's what I did. I wrote back to the Vatican and simply said, my conscience will not allow me to recant. What you are asking me to do is to lie, to go against my conscience. As we all know, conscience is very sacred. It connects us to the divine. And when we violate our conscience, we're not at peace, that, that deep inner joy somehow that we have in our hearts. That peace, I don't know, it, it, it goes away. We can't sleep at night. And then, more recently, I did get another letter. And I went about my ministry, never got anything in writing, anything official. And just more recently, three months ago, a letter did come from my superior of the community, the Marino Order, after a meeting in Rome. He's been ordered to write this letter, which I received, simply saying the same words. I must recant my position, or I will be dismissed, expelled from my religious community and the priesthood. And so just two weeks ago, I did write my letter, my response, again, addressing the issue of conscience, of conscience. That letter that I sent is open, it's very public, there's a copy on the table if you would like to take a copy and share with others. And I just want to say, though, I'm, it is serious, I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that right now there is this big discussion that's going on in the church about this issue of women's be women being ordained. The Pope is saying that this is an issue that we cannot discuss. But as adults, we find that very offensive. As an adult, to be told you cannot discuss some issue, uh, it simply does not make sense. And so we are discussing this issue. More are coming into the circle. And it's called freedom of speech, dialogue, debate, civil discourse. And I'm very encouraged because in my travels, uh, I meet so many people. The poll, CBS and New York Times just a few months ago reported in their poll that six out of ten Catholics, the vast majority, would support the ordination of women. And many of my fellow priests all support the ordination of women but are very fearful to go public. But I think there will be, there will be more crossing the line and breaking their silence. So we move ahead. I do believe, I, I hope that we can move ahead with hope that we will not allow anger to consume us. And um, because when anger takes us over, something happens, that, that hope and that joy sort of disintegrates. So let's hold on to our hope. And I know, um, I think of the words as I close, the words of Bishop Oscar Romero, who before he was assassinated said, let those who have a voice speak out for peace and for justice, for equality. That's where we come in. We have a voice. We have a voice. And he said, you know, there is always something that we can do for peace and justice and equality, and we can do it well. So uh, we have work ahead of us. Thank you. Father, Father Roy, you have taught us a lot this evening, and you have reminded us that uh, the struggle for social justice, liberation theology, starts in university campuses, and that one person is not small, but every single person can make a difference and can impact social change in the world. Thank you very much for the work that you have done. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions. If you have any questions for Father Roy, please. 
questions, comments, <coughs> inspirations, understanding, maybe the... All right, uh, Claude. Please. I just wanted to know what exactly are you fighting for? Like, I, don't, I don't understand, first of all, what the ordination of women mean. Um, so is that the only thing you're fighting for in the, in the Catholic Church for women? I mean, uh, that's a, you know, a good question, maybe a little clarification. I mean, it is, it's another one of those justice issues uh, that I discussed, you know, for years um, addressing this issue of uh, militarism, U.S. foreign policy, especially in Latin America, Central America, uh, trying to change U.S. foreign policy, trying to shut down, you know, a combat military school at Fort Benning that, that has and continues to cause really suffering and death in these countries. I, I connect it to an issue much closer to home. Hey, let me just say, I, I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to be selective about our justice issues. That's why I was so inspired reading and hearing the stories and reading about Dr. Zepp. I mean, I mean, I mean it, he made those connections, um, those, that interconnectedness of, of issues. Um, the issue, like when we gather, yes, we focus on this issue of closing the school, but at our workshops and the many teach-ins and the, the, the variety of speakers who come in from all over the country, many of them college students, they bring with them to the gathering other issues of injustice, um, homophobia, racism, sexism, militarism, environmental issues. That's really killing our, killing Mother Earth. So many issues that, and needless to say, we've discovered sometimes that, you know, we, we can't work on every issue. We, you know, we have a certain amount of energy and time. And I must say, one thing I've discovered, to just a footnote to that, mm -hmm. is this issue of burnout. We, it's so important for us to take care of ourselves. Uh, I really like, always like to put in a plug for solitude, for silence in the midst of the activism. We, most of us, we're activists. Dr. Zett was an activist. But I'm sure he, like all of us, had to withdraw and be quiet. That Psalm 47, be still and know that I am God. Just simply, I, I've become a great lover of silence and solitude in the struggle for justice and peace and equality. Uh, in order for, to sustain myself, I do hope that we see this work as a marathon. It's not a part-time, you know, um, sprint, as they say. I mean, this is a marathon, a lifelong job. And our work, as we know, <coughs> is not a lot. We're connected to the struggles of people here at home and abroad who have been struggling for so long, for so long. And we are but, you know, a humble part of that, that work for justice. Um, I saw someone in the back ahead, please. As a fellow Catholic, I was wondering your position on the uh, school of America. I, I want to kind of, the way I view, I try to view the positive people. Um, so I guess my question is, why, or would you, how do you, do you think that the School of Americas, the concept of the, of the School of Americas is a good idea, but that the implementation is not, in that, you know, we do need help training forces for, you know, the radicals. However, it sounds like some of the stories that you have encountered are, are very negative. Um, do you know of any stories that are more, more positive that come from the School of Americas, or? Good question. Uh, let, let me say, I do believe when they, when they initiated, they began the school all legally through Congress um, um, way back in 1946, 47. Uh, the language, I think, was, was uh, what they believed. We will start this school in Panama to bring these soldiers from throughout the region of Latin America to train them, to bring stability to these countries. And I, I, perhaps it was a noble cause and well-intentioned, but something happened. As we go back and look at what happened, we began, for example, the, the landless farmers in, in Bolivia. El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, some of you I know have been to Guatemala, uh, when they spoke out for food for the table, simply saying, we can't make it on a dollar a day. 
and they suffered and they saw their children again die before their time, they, they were called comunista, marxista. And that, that was the, the Cold War days, you know, when, when you dare to speak out. I remember again debating at a, at a college, there were hundreds of students there during that, those years of the Cold War, when we in the Soviet Union were like this. I mean, all I wanted to do, the starting point I said, I was debating someone from the State Department in Washington. Big debate. And I, I wanted to begin, let's begin with the reality, the starting point. If we arrive in El Salvador and look around, it's just the majority of the people are struggling for survival. He said, you sound like a Marxist to me. No, no, I'm a human being. And that is the truth, that's the reality. We have to start here. How do our sisters and brothers live here? Who owns the land? 14 families. Who has the power? 14 families. There was just a, a, just a disproportionate amount of greed was there. And let me just say, what the, and I've debated three commandants of the School of the Americas at different universities. Uh, we believe, as we know, you know, in debate, in, in civil discourse. Uh, and no one called another, you know, a heretic or a communist or the commandant of the school gave his reasons why the school should continue. And I, representing the SOA Watch movement, simply gave my reasons why I think it should be closed. And I, you know, had I stayed in the military, perhaps, I, I mean, I could see myself as the commandant of the school. But something happened. I went to Bolivia. I became a Catholic priest. I was introduced to a, a different side in El Salvador. And, and I simply said that. Uh, we, you know, we root our truth in, in our experiences. And we're all, you know, we, we have to be honest to that, our experiences. And lastly, he did say, he did say that we are about teaching democracy here. And with all due respect, I simply said, Colonel, I, I have a problem with that, simply because many of us in our movement have been in the military, and one thing we know, we did not learn democracy in the military. <laughs> Nor do you teach democracy behind the barrel of a gun. Um, but it was a very, you know, civil discussion. Um, the big problem, and one last thing that's very important, because we have a letter that's going to President Obama. It's not easy to get his attention today, as you know. Uh, but very important or our budget cuts, the issue that's all about budget cuts. I don't know how it is here, but where I live and in my travels, so many schools, um, healthcare programs are, are being cut and they're gonna go ever deeper. This school is taking about 25 million every year from our taxes, our money. Meanwhile, <clears throat> schools for our children in Columbus, Georgia, or having their budgets cut. I mean, a lot of these schools are minority schools, schools for the poor, and they're struggling, and they are getting their budgets cut. And I'm happy because Republicans and others, Democrats both, are for the first time looking at this school as an economic issue, as a place perhaps they can cut. And we're very encouraged because just a couple of weeks ago, uh, over 70 members of Congress, including some Democrats and Republicans, sent a letter per to President Obama asking that he use his power as president with the, in, um, an executive order, which he has the right to, to close the school by executive order, line item veto. He can close it tomorrow. And so that letter has arrived. I ask you also if you feel you want to weigh in on this, uh, a, a, a call, email, um, our visit to your member of Congress on this issue would be very, very important. We're really looking at the economics involved here. True, it's, it's a social issue, a moral issue, but it's also an economic issue now, especially. Also, our website, perhaps you can get a little more information if you'd like, soaw.org, soaw.org. We have a, uh, our main office the, uh, <coughs> is in Washington, D.C the national office. We have a, some seven, six, seven working there. Um, most are right off out of college. Uh, you might also, during the summers, we, we look for interns to go to, to work at the office. Uh, think about it, we'd love to have you. 
Uh, I must say that it's simple living. It's what we call solidarity wages. Uh, <laughs> but, but check out the website, soaw.org. Uh, um, does it hang there? Um, say on the grounds of your excommunication, if that does go through and you don't win your appeal, as a believer and as a social activist, what's your next step? I will be free, my brother. <laughs> Now, when we, we know, when we follow our conscience, um, I mean, it's amazing what, what, what the, the peace, the joy it can bring. And I know this, I know this. I, I mean, I've done a lot of the discernment. <clears throat> I would rather live under a bridge, go to a soup kitchen. I've kind of looked at a few of them, but, but really, <laughs> always good to have a plan B. But, but no, uh, I don't think it will come to that. Um, my ministry will continue. If they choose to excommunicate me, kick me out of the priesthood entirely, it's going to be hard. I mean, as I mentioned, as I sent to my, my letter to my Merino leadership team, <clears throat> you have been my family for 44 years. I've been a priest with you for 39. You have been my spiritual home. And it's, it's very, you know, it'll be very hard. Uh, but we've learned, and I, I remember reading this about Dr. Zepp and other great peacemakers, when we really, really take these issues of justice seriously and, and live them out, there will be often, not all of them, often consequences, consequences. I was very moved when I read that. Um, I know when Dr. Zepp and others from this area, way back during the civil rights days, you know, had sit-ins at restaurants downtown to integrate. Um, he and the family um, received some hate calls, death threats, um, but they did not allow their fear to, you know, to prevail. Uh, they moved ahead, as so many did. Dr. King, Rosa Parks, fear could not be, could not, you know, prevail. They kept moving ahead at great cost. And so I've learned, as many of us are learning, when we break our silence and address these issues of, of, of uh, injustice, uh, there are consequences. But it's a process. It's a journey. What I'm discovering, as many have, is that you also discover yourself on a deeper level. Um, someone, there's something I just um, risk going out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. You know? um, please. Uh, yes. Well, well, well. For my entire life, I've been trying to follow the uh, peace teachings of the Catholic Church, and but um, like recently, I, I've I've been kind of debating with myself like these um these like in, like like in um, like the uh, the, uh, the situation now when you have people with like a, like great calls like rising up against dictators and um like I I love the cause and I want to support the cause, but like also um like um it's like uh, like using guns to, to, to I guess um to meet your goals. That's not peace. But at the same time, like I, like when you are with um and like assassination of the um of, of like like um like these like uh, these <coughs> terrorist leaders. Like I I can't honestly tell myself that I'm that I'm not happy that they're dead. But at the same time, I. And I want peace, I pray for peace. So I was wondering your opinion about that contradiction between peace and fighting with violence for what's for us. Yeah, so, you know, we can discuss this. It's such uh, important issues you bring up. I, I just feel, though, that, you know, we, we have to keep asking those questions, dialogue, discussion. Um, no one has a monopoly of the truth, of course. No one becomes the owner you know, of the church or the faith community. No one knows the will of God. Uh, we're, we're all in this together. And I, 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 what's so important is that we, we really try to be respectful, I think, to, to each other. That we not, um, I think, humility, with that great prophet <coughs> who was asked, well, you know, what are we to do? And he simply said, we are to act humbly. We are to act justly and, and love tenderly. Um, and that, of course, is hard to live out, but that's the goal. I and mean, we try to do that. Sometimes we don't succeed. But um, 
I, I, again, I'm, I'm filled with hope and joy because I see things happening. I, I, I'm going back, I'm, I'm learning from history also. The civil rights movement, so many tried. I mean, I grew up in the rural South, and I, I look back and I said, I was asleep. <laughs> you know, why, I mean, how could we have these separate schools? I don't recall any, any of the t white teachers there questioning, saying, we've got a problem here. In our little church, the last five pews, segregated. I mean, how could this have been? And there were many who tried to use, again, the tradition, I mean, to keep segregation, to keep that racism going. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Um, and also the women's suffrage movement. There were many. And it, 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 it saddened me when I read the Catholic Church's role in this. Cardinal Gibbons from Baltimore, the most powerful Catholic Church leader, and other church leaders in the Catholic Church use their powerful voices and church money to try to stop the right of women to vote. They couldn't do it. They did cause many problems, and I must say set up many obstacles and caused a lot of suffering, but they could not do it. And what I've learned, I, this movement also, this gender equality issue in a church and in the workplace, um, the issue of don't ask, don't tell, how could that have existed for so many years? The line. And what we, I find great hope because I see that these movements rooted in justice are unstoppable. They can't be stopped. And what's so important, I think, is, is for us, as Ira Depp and Zepp and so many, you know, did here, wherever, you see an injustice and you look for ways that you can address that. Not in such heroic ways, but perhaps in humble ways. But um, you, we join our voice, like as you mentioned, with other voices. We are not alone in this struggle for peace or justice or, or equality. And that's what I'm seeing. When you bring together voices, and it's all about solidarity, solidarity. And I learned that word, and maybe we can stop here. I learned that word in Bolivia when I arrived. That all important word, solidaridad. They said it's all about solidarity. You know, to walk with, to unite with, to accompany. And that's what I think we are invited to do as peacemakers in the struggle for justice and equality, to be in solidarity with others. And like Bishop Romero said, we can all do something and we can do it well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Roy. And uh, we are pleased that you could come and be the, uh, I'll give the inaugural lecture for the ZEP Memorial because it, it, your, your work epitomizes what uh, Dr. Zepp was all about. And thank you to the uh, Zepp family for your general support and to all the uh, sponsors for this uh, lecture, to the college administration and to all of you for coming. We hope after this the college is really going to be the center for social justice and peace in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.